I'm a mum, firstly. Um, I have two children, um, aged nearly 18 and nearly 16. <laughs> I've been my son's full-time carer since he was about four years old. He was diagnosed with autism when he was two. Um, so that is basically who I am. I've done various different um, voluntary jobs throughout the years. Very outdoorsy, always outdoors, always active. Um, used to really love skiing. I was about to actually do my ski instructor training about two weeks after I was admitted to hospital. Um, used to love swimming, swam since I was very little. Cycling as well, I used to lead health cycles in Ferndown Forest and Moors Valley. I took my son away for his birthday weekend with a friend and her child. Um, and we went for a lovely walk. I had a very mild headache start that evening as well. And then the next day I woke up and it was really quite bad. Um, took paracetamol, ibuprofen, and it really did nothing at all. And I just tried to carry on as usual. You know, you're on holiday with your kids and stuff. You need to just get on with it. So um, try to ignore it best as best I could. Um, the following day we were going home. Again, it hadn't got any better. I had more ibuprofen, more paracetamol. And I was thinking I'm probably going to have to go to the doctors when we get home. Um, I don't remember the drive home at all. And um, when I got home, apparently my mum was with the children anyway, because um, my oldest, because we were away for the weekend. And she said she'd stay because I looked apparently really bad. And um, my son tells me that I'd spent the journey home swearing and shouting at both of my, uh, um, the kids. So obviously that was out of character already. Um, got home and went to bed. Um, and my mum says that she tried to wake me up to find out what the kids would need for dinner. And she couldn't wake me up, really. Um, she said I was really out of it. So she phoned the doctor, and the doctor tried to speak to me on the phone. And apparently at that point I was slurring my speech. I'd slightly come around. Um, but she couldn't understand me either, and she knew that something was going on. So she said to my mum, I'll be there very soon. So within about 15, 20 minutes she was at my house. Um, and she said that she thought it might have been a meningitis to start with but something didn't quite add up. She couldn't quite put her finger on what it was because it didn't seem to be that, even though the symptoms were quite similar. Um, so she basically called an ambulance and they had me in hospital within about half an hour of that. Um, luckily, um, that happened when it did because by the time I got to hospital, I couldn't breathe for myself. So they had me on a respirator pretty much straight away. And then after a few hours, I think they put me into a medically induced coma and yeah, that was the start of it all, really. <laughs> After a few days, uh, they tried to take me out of the coma, and I, I was then in a natural deep coma. Um, they did various pain stimulus tests and things like that that they do over the course of the next week or so. Plenty of MRI scans, CT scans, um, and they actually did lumbar punches as well to find out what was going on. Um, they diagnosed viral encephalitis to start with. So after three weeks, I came out of the coma and I was completely paralysed, actually. And that's when they realised it was more than just viral encephalitis. So they then re-diagnosed me with acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is ADEM. Um, and that obviously involves not just inflammation of the brain, but it involves the spinal cord as well. So that was why I had been paralysed. When I first came out of my coma, um, the first thing that people tell me about when that happened is that they were relieved that I knew who they were. So my partner had been there and apparently I blew him a kiss and that was the number one thing to say that you haven't actually lost your recognition of who these people are. And that was obviously a good thing. Um, I was trying to talk. I actually thought I was talking. So I was mouthing all my words, but apparently I wasn't coming out with anything. One of the other memories I first have is trying to eat. And I couldn't, because obviously when, when I had come out of the coma, they realised I was completely paralysed. They then started me on some very high dose steroids, so I started getting some movement back in my upper body quite quickly. And I was able to try and do things for myself. So they had then had to teach me how to use a knife and fork, and they sort of put these big tube things around my knife so I could just hold them like that. Because obviously you, use your, you lose your dexterity, so that was very <laughs> interesting trying to eat. Um, I had no appetite though. Um, it took me nearly two years to get my appetite back. I still don't feel thirst at all. Very strange little things like that.
I was in hospital altogether for about just under four months. Um, I spent about two months um, in Bournemouth Hospital and the physio there was absolutely fantastic. I used to have physio every single day and sometimes at weekends as well. And one of the girls actually used to come and see me sometimes twice a day if she had a break from someone else or there was a cancelled appointment or something. So they were really very, very good. And obviously it was quite high intensity rehab. So I had to learn how to stand up. Um, I was starting to get movement back in my legs and, but it was all still very numb. So trying to stand on legs and feet that you can't actually feel is just so out of this world. I can't even explain it. You know, imagine trying to stand when you don't actually have legs. It's just, that's how it feels to you. It's very, very strange. Um, but luckily after I think another few weeks, I started getting some tingling in my, in my feet so I could just about tell that I, I had feet <laughs> and that they were there and I could actually use them. Um, movement was very slow to come back initially though, you know, sort of a, a flicker of the toe and then the next day a, a little bit more of a flicker and then the day after that maybe the other toe would flick and that kind of thing. It was very, very gradual. Every day there was a slight improvement. So it just comes on over time. There's lots of residual problems, obviously because I've had spinal cord injury as well. It's basic day-to-day -day functioning, so bladder and bowels and things like that are always an issue. Um, in terms of the encephalitis side of things, yeah, memory is really, really bad. My short-term memory is very, very bad. If someone asks me about this later, I won't really remember what I've said. Um, I have to have everything written down. I need alarms for medication, alarms for when I need to get up, when I need to do this, do that. If I don't write stuff down, have it written, have it on a, in an alarm thing, it doesn't work. Um, I've got boards everywhere as well, notes all over the place. And it's just, again, learning how to manage that kind of thing. Um, balance is an issue, um, has been quite extensively. Um, I've done an awful lot of rehab to do with balance issues. So I'm better now, but I still tend to be very sway. I sway a lot, you know, and I bang into things when I lose footing and things. Cognition is not great. So I find it very, very hard to read and to write now. It depends on how fatigued I am. Again, fatigue's another issue. Um, by the end of the day, sometimes I can't even really speak. Yeah, I'm that fatigued, you know. Um, how to manage things. So I can't, it's, I find it very hard to make decisions about things now. I like to have someone else talk me through things. Impulsivity is another problem. So I'll just do stuff without even thinking and then two, three days later think, oh, why did I do that? You know, it's very hard to manage everything. I used to love being out, being social, and now it's very, very different. If I do see people, I prefer it to be small groups, maybe one or two people. One of the things I actually find a positive about having this brain injury is that I now understand my son a lot better because he has autism. I now have meltdowns. I get upset. I lose my rag very easily. And it's realizing why that happens that helps. So you know it's to do with the cognition and how your brain functions and things like that. So once you've learned all of that, you can accept it a bit more. And also when you feel it coming on, to take a step back and allow yourself some extra time and also for the people around you to learn that sometimes you need a bit of distance and you need to be on your own sometimes and just be allowed to cool down, you know. And then when you come back to regular, it's all fine again. So just learning to manage yourself, really. It's had a massive impact on my family, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something you don't really consider to start with when you're in this position, when your brain's not functioning the way it should. Online information's been very good. The first thing anyone ever said to me is, go onto the Encephalitis Society's website and have a read. And I did that when I was in hospital and actually joined the society when I was in hospital. Um, so that was a really good resource. So there's an awful lot out there if you know where to look. Do a search, do a Google search, <laughs> really helps. <laughs>